All right, we're going to get started. Yeah. All right, so thank you all for coming. We really appreciate it. Uh, before we get started, I'll quickly clarify that throughout the talk, we do an anonymous Q&A. So if you want to participate in that, and we encourage you to do so, go to slido.com and submit the code F-O-W-U-C-D. We also will be doing a raffle at the end. The raffle prize is for people who are present. Just something to keep in mind. And uh, we have two great speakers here with us today. We have David Grant, a UC Davis School of Law alumnus who currently leads Pop Sugar Studios, which develops, produces, and distributes Pop Sugar branded digital video content, television, and film for a monthly US audience of 40 million people. It's a lot of people. He conceived of and launched Fox TV Studios, which is not the same as Fox News. Think of Malcolm in the middle. Growing the studio to a major global television supplier which has produced thousands of hours of scripted reality and documentary television in over 25 countries. During Grant's time as president, the studio produced numerous Emmy, Golden Globe, and Peabody winning series. Dr. Jeanette Ruiz is an assistant professor in the Department of Communications at UC Davis and a campus faculty scholar. She was also a first generation college student. Her specialty lies in strategic communication with a specific interest in emerging practices in digital and social media. She's worked as a human resource and public relations consultant for various nonprofits, healthcare, and financial organizations. And past research of hers has focused on international social networks, public health communication, and cultural assessments of media advocacy. So with that being said, please give a round of applause for David and Jeanette. Thank you. It's wonderful to have all of you here. Before we get started, I'm just curious, are any of you in the online COM3 class? No. Okay. Just wondering. <laughs> so there you go. So much for marketing to your students. Um, but speaking of students, um, one of the interesting questions I often get when I teach the strategic communication course is, I have a Facebook, I have an Instagram, so I know analytics. Can any of you relate? How many of you feel you know analytics? Yeah? Yeah. So I was hoping that with your expertise you could touch on true analytics for how you, how you use them, how you engage with them, and how it might be useful for our students to understand. Um, first, I want to say I, I, I've heard that finals are next week. So uh, you guys are either out of your mind, <laughs> desperate for some cupcakes, uh, or interested in the topic. So I, I hope it's uh, all three of those. Either way, thank you. Yeah, th so thanks for coming. Um, so I spent a lot of time um, uh, at what I call the intersection of data and storytelling. And um, I'm going to keep in mind that this is the future of work, but I think there's um, a lot of work to be done in that area. So, and I think there's, there's a pendulum. Um, so when I started out in the business, it was all about, like, do you have a gut? Like, you hear a story and you go, like, oh, that could be a hit television show, or that could be a movie. And everything was about your gut. And the kind of polling that you had was, was something called, strangely enough, uh, a friend of my dad's invented something called Cinema Score. And a guy would go out in the theaters and he would say like, would you give this movie an A, B, C, D, or F? Uh, and then they would give it a grade. And the cinema score would be, uh, let's say it was a B. And that would have a huge impact over time. And people would say like, I don't want to see a B movie. This is expensive. I want to see an A movie. And that was actually the first analytics that I can remember. It was literally people walking out to theaters and exit polling theaters. Um, today, the pendulum has swung in some ways like way to the other side, which is, there are you know, giant advertisers uh, that I deal with on a daily basis, and they believe that the entire answer lies in analytics, that you can actually scientifically uh, and algorithmically find your way to a great story. And I have seen some awesome art painted by computer algorithms, and probably some pretty good short stories I've read by computer algorithms. But um, the hard part, the real art to it, is taking these analytics, and one of the problems is we have too much information. So let's say in my company we're getting you know, a billion uh, pieces of data uh, you know, like a week, essentially. 
um, and how, first of all, how you collect that. There's, there's, and then what is the story that that data is telling you? And that's a huge uh, field that is way over my head. Uh, but the people like you, I'm sure, would be um, amazing at. And if you can tell me that story, then my job at that point for me is to say, what's the insight I get from that? What does it really mean? So for example, it's kind of like just popped in my head, but this is a real example. Two years ago, uh, or about a year and a half ago, every time that we did a video that involved a grandmother, uh, and my audience is all uh, basically millennial and Gen Z women, it would go viral. And we were trying, so the analytics people were saying like, it all like, how do you, how do you make a great video? It put a grandmother in it. So we tried, we called it, we literally created a verb called grandmothering. It's like, can we grandmother this? Like, it's a normal story about this, but can we put a grandmother in there? Because we know that'll make it really successful. Uh, and it turns out, like, the insight was, like, way more complicated and way more nuanced than that. And so as we dug deeper into the data, and we have some good data scientists, um, what you begin to realize is it was somebody that could tell you later in life that you could live a good life when you were older. And that was of great interest to someone who was 28. So it was like to get from the data to that insight and then to use that insight, and now we know the story that we're telling, it was to me a really good example of uh, kind of the, the blend of data, data turning into insights, insights turning into good storytelling. And I'm glad you touched on the insight piece because a lot of my students don't necessarily have a good grasp on the data itself but they're very creative. And so they can maybe take a bunch of information and create mm -hmm. a story that makes sense for you. And you touched on the insight piece, but can you talk a little bit about how the stories resonate, especially in the work that you do, and how that translates to the audience? Um, well, one good, so it used to be when I was making um, only like expensive television shows, um, you really only had one shot uh, so you would make it and you use all your gut instinct and put this person in this role and told this story and spent, you know, six or seven million dollars on a pilot and then you said, okay, do people like it? And you'd go into a focus group and you'd see uh, people say things that seem so obvious. You'd be like, oh my God, I can't believe I missed that. Uh, and you're done. You can't do it over again. But uh, we've made uh, about 24,000 videos. So, we, and we've gotten data from every second of what happens in those videos, from what the resting image is, to the cadence of the story, to the length, to the topic, to things in there. And you can build profiles over time that really do help you tell those stories, if you can get to the insight, which is if you can take the data and, and, and understand what the data means in terms of human condition. And that is, again, I guess I'm repeating myself, but the big gap is what I see in the digital media business is this gap between collecting data, having people, uh, and there's a, there's a great uh, uh, area of journalism called data journalism, which I love. I, if I had to start over, I might do that. <laughs> I may, or maybe I'll do it anyway, uh, which is really taking data and telling you, great, telling you uh, graphically, just communicating in an instant what that story is. And, and to me, that's a form of storytelling. And so if you can tell the story of what, if you can discern the story that that data is telling you, you can actually apply it to uh, creativity and it can give you tremendous ideas. But then beyond that, you need to be creative. So it, it can't be, it's not a purely mechanical exercise by any means. And on that, uh, along those lines, a lot of the students also often, uh, when you talk about creating a story where students are interested in this idea of creating their own story on social media platforms, and so they put themselves out there in a, in a way that sometimes is very vulnerable, but in an effort to become an influencer. So a lot of students will say to me, how can I tap into this market? So they're very aware that the market exists because they are patrons of this market, but wanting to know, how do I become an influencer? How do I use my story, my, uh, the way I see the world, uh, to market into becoming an, a social media influencer. Yeah, I think it's a bad career choice <laughs> to... We both agreed <laughs> to say to that, I'm going to turn myself into one of those. Uh, on the other hand, I think I was reading that uh, the soccer player or European football player, Christian Ronaldo, made uh, something like $78 million a year for it's his like Instagram 90. Post. Is it 90 now? He's, he's raised his rates. Uh, but 
I think, I think it comes down to your ability. Well, first of all, there's a lot of hard work that goes into that. So, and I don't know, you, UC Davis undergrad doesn't strike me as a, like a group. I'm, I live in LA, so it's like I do live. If I'm talking to a group this size, there is half of the people in there are going like, uh, I think I'm going to major in being an influencer. Uh, so, <laughs> I don't, I don't I, like when I go up here, I don't really get that vibe. You guys are way smarter than that. Um, but, I, but I do think um, what it really boils down to, and this is a big change in the, in the present uh, state of work, I think will be in the future of work, which is a complete redefinition of what a brand is. And so a brand is really all about trust. And individuals, and I think, you know, I'm a big uh, NBA fan, and so I, I, I'm really, over the years, been really struck by how NBA players have done such an amazing job at becoming individual brands. And they've actually taken great power away from the, uh, not a bad thing, from the uh, people who run the NBA, the league, because they are each a sub-brand on their own. And so when you do think about going forward in the workplace, uh, because of social media, because of how much exposure you have or how exposed you are, you're, you are building your brand, whether you know it or not, every day. Some people have an instinct for building that brand in a way that's, that will be monetizable. But, you know, and there's, there's a couple of strands for that. One is trust, because, you know, in a world where no one seems to be agreeing on what facts are, for example, if you, if you connect with someone on a human level and you trust them, that's valuable. So if you're someone who could build trust is a big deal. And then the second thing is like this, and this is the, the bad part of social media in my mind, which is the, the aspirational, like, I wish I was that person. Uh, now, there's actually a backlash of that going on, which you guys may be aware of or be a part of, which is um, there's a greater, things go in, in pendulum, there things are pendulum and cycle driven, and there's a much greater affinity now for authenticity of like, my life's not perfect. Uh, it actually started with the moms. So moms on social media got very big because they were really saying like, you know, being a mom is really hard and I look like hell. And let's celebrate that. Um, and, you know, their, uh, their, you know, next generation after that was still like, life is perfect, look how fantastic this is, don't you wish you were me? And I think the, the, the pendulum is now going much, and I'm seeing just in the analytics that we get, is, and why Instagram stories, for example, is overtaking Instagram, because it feels much more authentic and we're actually having to teach, uh, and they're learning pretty quickly, like celebrities, to be less glamorous, uh, just to be yourself. And once you get used to communicating with somebody, or feeling like you're communicating with somebody uh, who's yourself, you actually build a very authentic brand. And if you're worth trust, or you're charismatic, that actually can turn into a career. And you touched on trust, and you touched mm -hmm. a little bit on facts, yeah. um, which leads me to think a little bit about uh, the reality mm -hmm. and how a lot of a lot of us and me included look at these stories and think how much of it is fabricated and how much of it is is true to life um, and when we initially spoke we talked about how the future of work because of media technology allows us to have experiences at the same time but not together in the same room and we I definitely see a decline in how we work as a, as a group as a result of that because we have the ability to Skype each other, for example, and not come in for a week or two. But how does that, how does that affect the relationships in your offices and how do you think that'll affect um, how we relate to each other moving forward in the business world? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I try not to be too old school, and I think about, like, you all chose to go to college. You could have gone to online college. Um, but you apparently thought that there was something missing about having your entire college experience um, experienced alone in your room. And I think that's true about work. So the kind of work that I do, uh, now, when, it, when we're producing uh, video and TV shows, clearly we can't do that alone. Uh, we, we have to do that together. And I kind of like that. It's a very collaborative activity. But a lot of people write, write things or, and, and they're in that phase and, or have meetings and you can do them alone. I think there's something, uh, I do think that there's something lost. And the better the technology gets. So it used to be that doing a video conference with like eight different people, let's say, was challenging. Like there'd always be like two of them would be 
like frozen and you know one would drop off and then the screen got so small like you couldn't see and it was supposed to switch when you're talking and it, like the person talking was like a little tiny like that. like it just wasn't physically that easy to do now you guys can all fast forward to like well what happens when you can you know use um AR and VR and, and these great tools where it's 5G, bandwidth is like unlimited and so everything feels instantaneous, will it, will it replicate um, the kind of um, interactions that you have when you're in the same place at the same time as people and things happen? And I will say, you know, being a part of a creative business um, and, you know, I've gotten credit and also been denied credit, but I've gotten credit for ideas that were not mine, not intentionally, <laughs> but it was like, it was because like, we were just in the right place at the right time and somebody said something that I just happened to hear that made me think of like if you just twisted it this way, it would be great. The, the, you know, the challenge I have now, because a lot of my staff, in, we do employee surveys and, and my staff, they're all like in their 20s, and they report like a big perk is that you can work at home. Uh, and uh, you know, so we do let people work from home when they want to. Uh, and obviously now there's unusual conditions and like working at home may be a requirement. And um, I'm always like stunned by that because I thought, isn't it like more fun to like go where everybody is? You can hang out, you can you know interact with people, you can have ideas. Um, there is something I think missed when you when you are not in the same space at the same time. And I know from management, I managed uh, one point at Fox. I had like you know people in eight or nine different countries, and I just could not run the place well. It was really hard. And today I have much better technology. I've got people in New York, I've got people in San Francisco, I've got people in London, and uh, I cannot manage them well, nearly as well as the people who are around me. And they can't, they don't feel like they're part of it. So when we're in a world where everybody is like somewhere else, um, I think the tech, maybe the technology will get so good that the nuance of communication will replace more of that, it certainly has, but I think that um, it's, it's still a challenge when you isolate yourself. And then I read that, um, you know, one of the biggest complaints of millennial workers is that they are lonely. Yeah, they feel lonely. They feel lonely, yeah. yeah and we, I'll go like, well, come to work. You'll feel less lonely. Well, we get that from, I get that from the students as well, mm -hmm. that um, especially now that I teach a fully online yeah. course, I don't get to know those students as well as the students that I am this close to on a regular basis. And they'll often reach out and say, I feel very disconnected, even mm -hmm. though you check in regularly and they can see me and we can chat and we can discuss, but it's, it's definitely missing that element. And, and you touched on that a little bit about how um, these young folks who are interested in branding themselves, uh, where do you see the disconnect or the differentiation between who you are and your brand? Um, yeah, certainly that, that you know, for, so from, from a business point of view, from a work point of view, um, there certainly is always the question of like your work you and your you you. And you can't, so I, I went through something really interesting a couple years ago. I hired a bunch of people that were really talented, they would go on camera, they got really popular, and they just came in right before uh, social media was a thing. And so their social media got stuck in our social media. And it was like we had cut off their arms and legs, like they couldn't leave, <laughs> like, because you know, they had no following of their own. Um, and so they, they didn't have, they really had a big, dis then they had to build it separately, they had a big distinction. Today, like, it's encouraged that that, the more blended that is, I think it's the advantage, so it used to be seen as a threat to companies, like if you had your own social following that was outside of the companies, and I probably felt that way too, like, you know, five or six years ago. Um, things have really changed. There's a general understanding that everybody's a brand, everybody who can and wants to should build their own following, and that having that separate following, uh, separate Twitter voice, whatever, um, actually I I increases the overall strength of the central brand. And so it's really, um, and, and one thing I would say that's changing, and this is just generational, um, you know, if you look at like say, you know, America in the 50s or Japan in the 60s, incredibly hierarchical systems, and so like, you know, and even when I started working, it was like a, you know, like a, a lowly, like a coordinator, you know, couldn't talk to a vice president, a vice president, you know, couldn't talk to a president. It was like a big deal. Um, there's just a lack of hierarchy now. And, and uh, so anybody, you know, through can, you know, DM anybody, anybody can commit, you can talk to a, like a, a, an incredibly powerful person directly. 
So the fact that that, that exists and that's not going away, there's just a great flattening, I think, of work. And so I think it presents tremendous opportunities for people to accomplish things without the same traditional hierarchical structures. Plus, you come armed, able to do everything on your own. So you've grown up in an environment where the technology enables one person to start a company. I, I'm working on a new startup. I don't want to talk about it. But um, in the new startup, I'm actually looking around and I'm thinking, I could start this company with no capital because I think that I can bolt together pieces of companies from other places who will offer uh, services that I would have had to build myself. And I'm literally with my, a good friend of mine sitting there going like, I think I could just build this company with just the two of us, this big company with no capital. That's something that really strikes me as like for you guys, that may be the norm or that may be easy to do, which is you can look at the world as a giant Lego kit and you can assemble the Lego pieces in some new and interesting way and make something. And if you feel like you can do that, then working in a company is going to be a big trade-off. And you're like, well, if I work in a company, they're going to stick me in this cubicle and they want me to do this job. And they don't want me to do that. Uh, and so there's a point at which you all, you might, many of you might find, uh, I, I think that's great, by the way, working at a company and learning how big organizations organize themselves is really, totally really agree. important yes. or interesting. Um, I think it's been really helpful to me to see how a company the size of Fox, or I ran a partnership that was three telephone companies, it was like you know, 400,000 people. Like, how does something that big get organized? Mind blowing. Um, but then, you know, then to like step back and say, I think I can actually put pieces together myself and, not, and, and replicate this organization through uh, arrangements I make with, with uh, uh, suppliers of things. Um, it really is the way the iPhone is put together. You know, it's like, it's very, very interesting. So I think there's gonna be a lot of opportunities for people who are creative in terms of putting the pieces together without having to build them from scratch. And I think that's like super exciting. That's something that just did not exist, you know, when I was thinking about this for the first time. And without divulging too much information about this possible startup, is this something where you'll be working fairly solo? In other words, not with a lot of people around you in a virtual office with folks working for you without a lot of direct face-to-face -face contact? Um, I, I need company. <laughs> so I, want, I don't want it to be like... So not for you personally. Uh, I mean, no, no. I mean, we, we, we will often, we are often getting together uh, through uh, Google Hangout and just like turn on you know, the Google Hangout and have a chat. Uh, but what we're really looking at is all the things that the first time around, I just started up, I raised some venture financing and then my current company bought that company. But that time around, and that was uh, 10 years ago, um, everything that you wanted to have, you needed to build yourself. So all the pieces had to be constructed. Every single thing that made that company back then, you could just buy off the shelf or make an arrangement to have it supplied off the shelf. And so uh, whether or not, I don't want to work alone, I like, like my friends and I want to work with my friends and I need that. Uh, but it's no fun, I mean, without that. But I don't need, I don't envision myself needing an organization of, you know, like, thousands of people or hundreds of people to accomplish what I think, you know, like five people could accomplish now. And along those lines, we talked also a, a little bit about how uh, we can probably attest to this more than most of the audience here, but we are more connected than we've ever been, but have felt more disconnected, I think, than we've ever felt. And uh, as a result of people being able to work independently uh, not necessarily having to come in face in work face to face. Um, we're seeing an industry pop up that we discussed, what we call in real life, mm -hmm. where uh, influencers do have uh, an enormous following that perhaps you and I may follow only on Instagram or Twitter, or we follow them online, but where they'll have a pop up event where that person will be there, and you may not necessarily have particular access to that person. Um, but you'll have access to other people who are also engaged with that person and that person's quote-unquote brand. Um, any thoughts on, on that and where do you see that going? Um, yeah, especially like in this particular uh, pandemic time or whatever you would call this thing, the, this business is about to be uh, take a, a real hit. But uh, uh, I guess I'm thinking the fact that there's so much attention paid now by the brands that support us into creating events or real life events that seem at the surface to be very non-economic. 
I mean, if like if you have a television message, you can reach you know 100 million people. If you have an online, I've got you know 40 million people coming every month. They can see a, an ad or a video that a video ad. Um, to, to put an event seems super labor intensive, and uh, I'm not in the events business. It would drive me crazy to do it. But like the amount of interest in trying to uh, replicate uh, or to create a venue where people are actually coming to something. Uh, so it's becoming like it's like voting, uh, not not voting now because you can vote by mail. But I mean, voting meaning like I like you enough that I'll actually go to a physical place where you are, and experience you. Uh, so we have an event uh, pop sugar called uh, Playground. It's like part play, part being grounded. It's all kinds of things it's in New York, and we had no idea how many people would show up. And uh, so we did our second one in June, and there were fifteen thousand women came, and it was not inexpensive. Um, and I, so I, myself, like, I, I'm, I just don't understand it because I just so hate events. But, but I, I was like, at this event, I was like, God, this is amazing. Like, people just really are um, palpably wanting to, like, interact with other people and get off their online selves. So, uh, again, I'm thinking in terms of work, you know, kind of creating experiences, and they don't have to be huge events. And obviously, retail is going through this big, um, uh, issue where like they need to entertain people enough to come to the, physically to their space, uh, but again, there's lots of uh, creative, analytical, and other jobs that are going to come in terms of people that can put together what I would call the mix between data and creativity, and to create these experiences uh, that drive people to come to a place. Since we're coming a little bit close to our the end of our time, I was hoping that maybe you could share with our students. Uh, what some of the exciting things that you see on the horizon that they might not be aware of, and then also some of the challenges that those exciting things might bring. Um, I'm going to, maybe it's just my mood, uh, but like, so I live in a world where, you know, Google and Facebook swallow everything. It's like the huge giant whale. If I made physical goods, maybe it would be Amazon, but certainly in the digital media space. Uh, and so I'm trying to like figure out, does that mean that there's a lot of opportunity for little interesting things that live at the edges, um, or is everything just going to be swallowed up? Uh, and then I, you know, so the debate going on in, in you know, politics right now is do you break up those companies, do you keep them together? If you break them up, could they compete with the similar companies in China and so on? Um, I, I get all that. I just am living the swallowing up and feeling what that's like. So I'm really curious to see, like, like does it go on forever? And am I just ultimately going to be consumed? <laughs> like, all, like, are we all going to be consumed? Or then what is the thing that's going to happen? Because obviously Facebook is, is already is on the decline. Um, Instagram is probably at the apex. Um, like, what? So there, there's, like, we're right around the corner from some other thing. And so if one of you in this room can think about what that other thing is, um, if I'm still around, I'll come work for you. Yeah. <laughs> but it's going to be a thing. Uh, because I really feel like we're at that point where these, these existing platforms are just, they're not that they're, I mean, they're incredibly innovative. So I'm not saying that they're not innovative. In the past, I think big companies like the phone companies start, stopped innovating. They had labs and stuff. But by and large, they were too like, fat and happy. But these companies still feel, lean, feel like super competitive. And so they're still energized, but they seem to be swallowing everything up. I do think you, when you see a slowing down at something like Facebook, and they're like, going, thank God we bought Instagram, uh, I, I think that there's like something else. So I would say to you guys, think of what that is. You could bolt it together with two people. Two of you could get together, even one of you, but it's more fun with two. Um, look around and say, I need, like, for example, like influencers. If you need influencers, there are now at least 10 SaaS platforms that will like provide you influencers. Like you can order influencers the way that you order pizza online. It's, it's insane. You say like, I need somebody who like appeals to like, you know, Asian men who like golf, who live in the southern half of the United States. Boom, I got like a list, just spits out a list of like, here's 200 of those. Um, it's, it's crazy. So you, there's every piece of this, in, of this little universe you need to build, you can build on your own. Uh, and I would say, think of what that is, and you can you can also test it without very with very little risk these days, by by uh, getting the supply on a kind of like a on the come basis, 
And you know, companies will work with you on the come because it's just increasing their market share. When there's 10 SaaS platforms supplying influencers, you can bet that you can get one of those influencers to like discount their price to you and actually give you like test, let you test on the come, for example. And that applies. To, that's just influencers. There's like tens of other things that you can try uh, using these, as I think of them as Lego pieces. Is this my raffle time? <laughs> <laughs> the student questions, oh, or questions. Uh, audience oh, questions. <laughs> That's right, we're, the, we're just getting started. Now is the fun part. And I'll just hold it like this. All right, so as said before, if you have any questions during this time, just go to slido.com on your phone's browser, any browser, and type in the code FOWUCD and you could submit questions and you could also vote up the questions that you didn't ask but you wish you had. But, but you can't raise your hand because that would be too easy. That's right. We want to let you guys be as antisocial and anonymous as possible. So Pick up be the bold, yeah. be brave. You could ask whatever. So starting at the very top, uh, we have a handful of people in the audience who would like to know, could one theoretically take the technology and strategies used at PopSugar and apply it to online education to increase engagement with content? Uh, I think it's happening. Uh, there's a number of companies, uh, I mean, you know, it, if, if one has the motive, you guys know this better than me, but if one has the motivation today and you're not in it for the grades, you can get a complete education for nothing uh, with the best professors in the world. So if, like, if there's ever been a revolution of something that like, would blow people's mind from 100 years ago, is like anyone in the world could take a class from Jeanette. Uh, and if their own like, professor of commu communications is boring, she's not, like, you could just listen to her. So um, uh, professors are, you know, like we all have had those professors who go like, this guy or this woman is fantastic. I was spellbound for the entire class. And we've all had the ones that like, you can't keep your eyes open and you can't understand a word they say. Like today, you actually could pick the ones that make great content. So like, it's already there. And I'm, I can speak for myself. I, I feel, we, and we didn't touch on this today, but where, I'm as a professor now because you're all sitting there with your laptops open. You can look something up just as easily as I can share it with you. So what's happened is I've become a, a curator of sorts of information, uh, trying to synthesize what I think is important and what I think would maximize not just student interest but what would be beneficial to the student. So uh, it's really interesting that even in my online courses, I'll often bring in people that I find to be experts in a particular area uh, that do a great job of relaying the information for the students in a way that I could have created another video, but why when this wonderful person who I've learned from can speak to my students directly? So I look at it as bringing in a, 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 an invited guest like I would for my face-to-face -face classes online and it's much more um, easy to navigate and coordinate. I'd say the, the one thing that I wouldn't apply from uh, my current company is, and it's not just my company, there's a whole group of companies where we've just become too reactive. So we know so much about what you're interested in that we just want to feed you more of what you're interested in. And I say that as a self-criticism. I mean, that's how we make money. So when you actually come to a place to really learn something, I think there's a lot to be said for that's maybe not the time to do that, that you actually want to hear from someone uh, who um, really has studied and learned something rather than us just trying to clickbait you into like reading more content or watching another video. So I would say uh, the lesson maybe from companies like mine is like don't apply that to this great world of education. The theory and research are important. Not always as exciting as the clickbait, but just as needed, just as necessary. I like the honesty. Uh, the next question that has shot up to the top is, uh, for David, which is, what advice would you give to someone who is seeking an entry-level production job at a major media studio like Fox? And it has to be a major media studio. Yes. Well, a major one. I was also going to ask <laughs> if you wanted the honor of just 
ripping that down before it completely falls, but it looks like it's no, doing like a fine job on its I own. I like the tension. No, keep it going. <laughs> <away. laughs> There's an over-under on when it's going to fall. Uh, so um, I'm just a big believer in, like, get in anywhere. Um, it doesn't matter. Uh, just, like, take the worst job. Don't, d first of all, the pay in your first five jobs doesn't matter. And, you know, when you think about, like, now it would be the equivalent of somebody saying, like, when you're a kid, like, and your, was your allowance, like, $5 or $5.25? Like, it was a huge, like, who cares? It was $5.25 or whatever. It doesn't matter. It, like, find a place that's doing something really interesting. And, like, one thing that's always still stuns me, by the way, from, from students and actually job applicants is they'll, like, link, they'll hit me on LinkedIn or send me a text or whatever, and they'll say, like, hey, do you, are there any jobs? which is the worst question you can ask somebody. Like, if I don't have a job, the last thing I want is somebody ask me if there's a job. But if you've done your research and you see that there's a job and you've figured out a great story to tell me about why that job should be yours, um, I actually will pay attention to that. And so, and the, you know, and, I, and then we'll say, so somebody will say, like, oh, I noticed that you are looking for a such and such. And it blows my mind because, like today, every like when I was looking for jobs, you had no idea who had a job. But today, every corporate site will tell you every job that they have. Uh, so if you find something that is remotely uh, in, in a company that's remotely interested in you or very interested in you, just try to get that job. Like, don't worry about what that job is because, again, you're in a very non-hierarchical generation. Uh, it's not like it used to be where if you were the low person on the totem pole, you'd never, you know, speak to the vice president or the senior vice president or whatever. But today, every, like, I hear from everybody. Like, there's no hierarchy. Anybody feels perfectly free to come, you know, stick their head in, in my meeting or whatever, interrupt me. Like, no one cares. And, you know, that's actually healthy. I mean, other than being too distracted, it's very healthy in that there's really no, there, there's really a lot fewer rules. I wouldn't say there's no rules, but there's a lot fewer rules. Uh, I remember when I was in uh, college, my, my roommate was a, uh, was a hair washer, and she wanted to become a hairdresser or a, a, a beautician or whatever you call it. And they said, like, and then, no, no, it was a, a fancy shop in Beverly Hills. It was called Menage a Trois. And uh, they said, no, no, the, the customers in this shop will never accept that a hair washer is going to become, like, uh, whatever you call the, the person who does your hair. Obviously not an issue for me. But... <laughs> Like that, that doesn't exist anymore. That really has changed. And so um, I have a great record of like assistants that I've had. And I will tell them, and, and, and I think I'm probably above average in this, but most people will. Um, you know, you could sit in on any meeting I have you want. You can, I mean, my assistants have my, my passwords. They could clean out my bank account. No one's done it yet. Um, they, can, they can take notes anywhere. They can listen to every phone call. I'll put it on a speakerphone. I mean, if they're going to put in the time and they get their work done, and I tell them, like, you can learn my job in, you know, a year. Then leave me and go do something else. So it's get in with people who are willing to do that, first of all. Don't worry about the title. Don't worry about the job. Um, and just find a place where you think there's a path or a chance for you to interact with people who are doing really interesting things, and eventually you'll get there. I would add also that sometimes an entry-level job is something where you're literally fetching coffee making copies, um, and that a lot of internships end up looking like that for some of our students. They don't utilize their skills very well. But I always tell my students that that's still an opportunity if you make it into one. So if you're fetching coffee for someone, and my students who are here have heard this story, if you're fetching coffee for someone regularly, it's really up to you in that position to at some point say, hey, latte lady, um, would you mind spending five minutes with me to talk to me about what you're looking for in someone in this position, or how did you come to be in this position? How, what was your, um, your segue into where you are now, and where would you like to be, and where do you see this going in the next five years? So you, have an op you create those opportunities for yourselves, sometimes in a situation that doesn't necessarily open it up for you. So it sounds like you're in a very open um, situation where you allow that for... Well, I got the benefit of I mean, I, I was the first... I mean, I, so I did some weird things. I was, a, uh, I was like a successful corporate lawyer, and I quit, and I became essentially a paralegal at a movie studio because I was like, had that philosophy, like, I just want to get in and do something different. And I was filling out triplicate forms. Literally, that's what I was doing. Um, and, I don't and, know if they know what that is. <laughs> I was filling out forms that had a little thing to make a copy and then sticking them in a notebook and then handing them to somebody. That was my job all day long. That's all I did. Um, and I, was, I knew how to work the copy machine. 
And so a group of the big executives were going to go to do this big deal. It was like the first time that Fox was going to sell like a whole package of movies. I think it was to the, like then it was the USA Network. And they were sitting there at night and they were like talking about the deal. And they, they needed to make copies. And they like didn't know how to use the copy machine. And so I said, well, I'll make the copies for you. So like worse than getting coffee, you know, like making copies. And, uh, and people don't even make copies anymore. But back then you made copies. And so I made the copies, and then they said, well, you look at this, and I like look, and then the next day I know, like, I was in the meeting. Like, like they had the meeting the next day, and it was in the same, and they go, well, why don't you come on in with the meeting? And my life was never the same after that. So, like, yes, I was like, that's, I was a glorified paralegal who quit, or a lawyer who quit, become a glorified paralegal. I made copies for a bunch of executives, they invited me to a meeting, and then they just all assumed, almost George Costanza like from Seinfeld like that I belong there some reason they they thought I was supposed to come I don't even think they invited me to be nice they just thought I was in the group and that was it that was like a huge break for me one lone clap yeah. more claps <laughs> uh, this next question is really interesting I think which is uh, what general impressions did you guys notice of that episode of Black Mirror, Bandersnatch, which was an interactive piece of media that was arguably uh, simultaneously used by Netflix to collect data. So if this sounds to me like a question about people being suspicious about companies collecting data. You're probably correct. And not a question about like, what did I think of Bandersnatch? And you didn't think they'd be interested in this. Uh, well, I, well, there's always the conspiracy people and the people that... Like, <laughs> Raise you know, your hands, yeah. conspiracy how many, So how many of you are, like, very concerned about the data that's being collected about you? So not... So that's the thing. It's like, so when you get to that website and it's like, oh, because uh, there's a new uh, Privacy Act in California and, and, and there's actually one around the world now or in Europe, and you get to that and it said, like, uh, you know, that annoying thing comes up and said, you know, like, can we use your cookies, essentially? Um, how many of you say no? And how many say yes? And it's interesting. Um, so what, I, what concerns me about this is so like we all, like mo most of you I assume are Netflix subscribers? Okay, yeah, they got it, everybody. Um, <laughs> and you notice that what's on your screen or at least I'm very conscious of what's on. So sometimes I pretend to be, well, I don't, sometimes I am me, and sometimes I pretend to be my kids. And I just want to see what's on their screen. Like if I say like, okay, my daughter's Kara, and I say like, who are you? And I say, I'm Kara, and I go on. And wow, like what popular on Netflix, what a lie. I mean, like it's popular if you're David Grant on Netflix. Like their popular on Netflix is very different. So what I, I do, it does bother me. I don't generally care, maybe it's my generation, like, you know, my life's an open book. You can, I, like I said, my assistant have my passwords. But you can, you, can, you can collect data on me. I say okay because I'm in the business and I go like, okay, that's more money. You know, people stop saying okay, it's gonna be harder for me to make a living. But I, this bubble of the truth is really bothersome to me. So I do think, so, so somebody collecting data and then deciding what it is that I wanna watch uh, the, the truth of what I would be interested in or the truth of what's popular on Netflix, I find really creepy. Uh, and, I, and then when I think about what's going on in politics today, um, I, I then sort of generalize that to the world of like these bubbles or these, these sort of closed loops where you're in somebody's algorithmic loop and you're in a reality that could be different than like my daughter watching in the next room. And you know, when I think about like how a, country or democracy you know, has, works together on things when we're watching this different, or we're experiencing this different sense of the truth, and the truth is, this is Netflix. These are supposedly not bad guys. These are like neutral-ish guys. I mean, maybe good guys. It doesn't seem like a bad place. But they're trying to feed, make me eat more stuff, and they're doing it by telling me what I want to watch, and I just find that really, really scary. So, I don't know. Is that, if Bandersnatch is a way of doing I think it goes way beyond Bandersnatch. And I mean, we every time we log in and search for something, it's collecting information about us. It's collecting data. Um, I often share with my students. I was doing an interesting research par project um, on how uh, partners feel about their partners' porn use, and so you can imagine what I started to get when I just was searching for my own stuff. It now thought that I was very interested in certain types of porn, and so. 
I had to no longer allow my child, who at the time was nine, to use my laptop because I would get the strangest pop-ups. And, and I, I asked my chair, who do I notify at the university um, so that they're aware that this is for research and I don't get in trouble? Um, and that's when I you became... You used your personal account for this? N no, my UCD account. Oh, yeah. Worse. Right. <laughs> And, um, and it's when I started to get the pop-ups that I realized I was in trouble. And that's, right. that's when I became really aware of how I was being watched and how I was being monitored and how this, this I was embarrassed, really, because I thought, there's this thing out there that thinks this is what I'm into, and who do I talk to about this? Um, and so it's, it's a really interesting thing to think about. And David and I, when we chatted, we thought, oh, you're so used to this. This, is your rea this has always been your reality, where... I honestly, when the internet came about, I said, ah, it's a fad. I, I said that, and now I can't imagine my life without it. And so I have to remind myself uh, very often that most of my students have grown up with it. This is, this is the reality that they've known. And so to me, it's always very curious when you become aware that you're constantly being watched. But on the other side, every time we walk into a, a quote unquote real life store, we're also being tracked. It's the stores are checking to see what time you walked in, where did you linger, how long did you look at a particular shelf. So all of that data is being collected at all times. So I think we've lived in that reality for quite some time. And I think that once we went online, we became more aware of that um, existence and, and the fact that we're being tracked at all times. I don't so know don't if that answers. Right, right. <laughs> mm, creepy. There's so many questions here that we're unfortunately not able to get through them all. So I'll just keep going with the top. Uh, this is switching gears a little bit. Another opinion question. Thoughts on TikTok? What do you think of its position and where it will go? I love TikTok. Oh, I, I, I hate TikTok. Love TikTok. Uh, so they, they came up with something that's really ingenious, and I have to say as a, as a you know, media person, which is... Um, it, so ingenious in that it sort of recycled something. Mm -hmm. When you used to like, back in the day, you turn on the TV and something would be on. And you go like, and if it was on the right channel, you're like, oh, okay, and you probably still do that. But I have a smart TV. So when I turn on my TV, it just is a Roku screen. Mm -hmm. And I have to make some decisions, like before I want to watch something, I have to say like, okay, like, am I feeling like Netflix? I want to watch, what, what, what do I want to do? <clears throat> TikTok, no worries. Like the minute you turn it on, you're in. And you, and it's, I, I do love the fact that now it will be corrupted. It may be corrupted now in terms of data, you know, uh, uh, leakage and all that, but I don't know. But I mean, it will be corrupted in that my world of corruption is advertisers. <laughs> advertisers pay my bills, uh, yet I'm constantly at war with my clients uh, because uh, what my clients want me to do and what my, users want me to show them are rarely the exact same thing. Uh, and so what I love about TikTok at this point in its evolution is that it really is just focused on like, it just want to have a good time. Um, it has unleashed some incredible creativity. I mean, some of the special effects and so on, I'm just blown away. And we're trying to grow our TikTok audience. There's no, we're not making any money on it because we just really want to understand um, like, you know, how to have fun and how to just get back to that real sense of delight that you get when, when you flip through it. But I can tell you, because I know the, the TikTok executives, that, you know, they're going to be under, uh, they are under massive pressure to make money. Uh, they're owned by a Chinese company, ByteDance, and, and, and that, is a, that is a serious company. <laughs> there's like, there's, they're, they're like really focused on making money. And so they're looking at a lot of ways to monetize, and I'm really curious to see how long the joy can last. Uh, but right now, it's just pure joy, and I could, like, whenever I'm feeling, like, kind of depressed or just, like, I just, like, it makes me happy. And I, I don't know how you feel. I have a totally different right. view on that because I have a 13-year-old boy who that's all he looks at is TikTok. And so besides, I, the one good thing is that now he's, into some really good 80s music mm -hmm. because it's recycled through TikTok. But um, <laughs> as someone who studies misinformation online, I'm always sort of surprised what he comes home telling me that's information from TikTok. And so I won't share some of that here because it's 
it's quite frightening, though, that the, a 13-year-old is getting views on the world and um, information about what's happening in the world from TikTok. So it's supposed to be fun, but when you're a young person and this is how, you, that's the platform that they're using to communicate with each other, so they'll send messages through the platform as well, but that's their information source. And so people are already utilizing it as a means of spreading information that's not true to our young folks. Yeah, I think that's probably true. Well, I'm, so I, I think that's true of every platform. I'm trying to think of one that doesn't have that issue. No, no. But it still has the joy to it, and it's kind of like its core purpose was for joy and just fun. And so I'm with a 13-year-old. I have no joy. There's no joy. <laughs> so there's something to be said for that. But yes, I mean, I, inevitably, if it, get, it is popular and is now going to be corrupt. So yes, I, it, we know where it's going. But like, get, enjoy it while you can. Uh, next question, and uh, the Bandersnatch question person did uh, post a follow-up saying, I really did want to know your general in question, uh, impressions. Cry face emoji, cry face emoji. I'm sorry. <laughs> so, the, you can see me afterwards. <laughs> the next uh, question at the top is, I think it seems uh, geared towards David again, is, is data or projected earnings secondary to an instinct you might feel about a good story, i.e. Uh, passing up on stories that you know are good because of analytics? Uh, so you hit on, that's a good question. Um, that's actually at the core of what I am struggling with and actually why I'm going to want to start a new company. Um, I think, so there was a point, I would say, in what I'll call the uh, independent uh, digital publishers the BuzzFeeds, the Pop Sugars, et cetera, Foxes, um, where we could, where the business was good enough for us to afford to do uh, both of those things. We could, we did stories that were data driven and we, and, and advertiser directed, and we did stories that were, um, uh, or video story, because you can write a post, it's very simple, but video is much more expensive that were purely like, what is interesting to our audience? Now, we never did, and this is always, we didn't, ever do enough or we don't ever do enough what I call real journalism, which is real reporting, which is going out and investigating. We just, as a business, we can't do that. So, you know, hats off to the, the New York Times, uh, which is now being accused of swallowing all other media, but um, they've actually built a machine that's big enough and power on, powerful enough to do that. But there's very few of those. <clears throat> you can count them on one hand. So um, I'd say that lately to survive, the, the independent publishers like my company um, have gone too far to the side or gone, have had to go too far to the side to be data-driven, to feed you what you want, to you know, give you what you, we think you'll consume more of as a, and then judge by how many people clicked, how many, people, how many page views, how many unique visitors, <clears throat> because that's how we make money. Uh, so it's very difficult. There's a move for a lot of companies to sub, uh, create subscription opportunities. So, you know, two ninety nine, three ninety nine, four ninety nine, five. But like, and your generation is very subscription friendly, which is great. You 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 buy things and you forget about it, and it doesn't seem like a lot. And we tell you like, oh, it's just like it's a it's a it's a venti latte once a week. Like, how big of a deal is that? And you go, yeah, you're right, and you pay. But you the number of things that people will really pay for is still very very tiny. And so you're ca we are caught in this very difficult position of saying we want to be more informative. Um, and actually, the founder of my company is, really does care about that. Lisa Sugar is the founder of Pop Sugar. There's a sugar person. Um, but it's very, very challenging to not fall into the trap of I need to generate page views, I need to generate views, and this is how I do it. I don't have deep reporting resources, I, have, I can actually cheat in a way with data because I can get so smart about what you want to see. And it's, so it's like Netflix feeding me what it thinks I want to see. And that is a big challenge. Uh, so uh, I, I would say that I would admit that, that we've had to go too far to the side of, of actually uh, being data driven. But would you say that's very different from if it bleeds, it leads, which has been network news for as long as it's been news? Yeah, well, I mean, you know, local news uh, has been that for years. Um, so I think that's something slightly different. It used to mean something slightly different, which is uh, it's how do you take a story that you've reported 
and tell it in a way that's sensational enough to get you to read it or, or watch it. And I, I understand that. But what really what's happening in this sort of independent world is people are just curating and writing about what they see, and they're good. So they understand, like, I th they know, the one thing they do is they know their audience. So they go, like, my audience loves X. And they'll just re, really just repurpose or, or add a, just enough to create originality. And the problem is it's very difficult to tell when, when that becomes the economic basis of your company to fund the kind of reporting that goes out and like spends like, you know, you'll talk to a reporter at the New York Times and she'll say like, oh, I spent two years on this story. Like that would bankrupt my company like in a, in a very short amount of time. So this, that's something that has not been solved. And, and if it bleeds, it leads, I'm totally fine with if the story is genuinely good reporting, I don't, you know, to say it in the most sensationalistic way you can. Um, but if it's really just regurgitating what's already out there, which is a huge aggregating and curating what's out there, um, I think that's, that's a, like a real problem when you fall into, if that's your only move, that's really difficult. So thank you, Facebook and Google, because they've taken all my money. And the next question is, do you think that graduate school, uh, be that PhD, master's, MBA, JD, whatever, is necessary and or helpful to work in media or marketing, or do you think it's better to set your sights on just getting a really uh, powerful, valuable internship out of college? Um, so I have two, three minds of that. One is I, I'm the person who pays for these uh, graduate educations for my kids, and man, wow, <laughs> costly. Uh, so I do find, so I started out saying to my kids, like, hey, I want you to all go to graduate school, I want you to do this, I want you to do that, and like the bills started coming in, and I would say like, do you, do you really think that you're gonna get something out of that graduate school? Um, I, I, so there's a bunch of issues that go along with that. One is, are you gonna be saddled with a lot of debt? Uh, you know, if we had life the way I would like it, you would not be saddled with a lot of debt, and you would make a pure decision. And I, I just feel like learning things is just gonna make you better. Uh, and you, so yes, practically speaking, I don't need uh, an MBA or, well, I do need some MBAs, but I don't, I don't need PhDs. Um, I don't know many people in Hollywood or the entertainment business who say they need a PhD, except for data science, uh, which is a big thing. So yes, for there, you need something really good. But, um, but when I'm looking at resumes, I'm really impressed with people that had the discipline and the drive and the curiosity to really study something deeply. So um, I have a bias towards that. And, and really, I don't know if it's logical, but I just think that I just want really, really smart, curious people. And so it's like, I don't know, it's like a marker. Like this person actually got into something so deeply and accomplished so much they got a PhD in it. Like, I'm just impressed with that. Like, what, is it, what could they do if they get a PhD in the thing that I want them to do? So it's really just about, I think I'd translate to like basic human traits. Do you have the drive and the curiosity and the energy to really get into something that deeply and master it? And like that, or, or, or I have interviewed, I've hired a, an Olympic athlete. Like, I was just like, okay, you've got the job. Like, how you could do that just like, like you know, blows my mind. Or I actually, in one case, you know, remember thinking I hired a black belt in, uh, I forget what martial art it was. I, it wasn't karate, but whatever. It was one of those martial arts. And I was just saying, wow, I was really impressed with like somebody who could get a black belt. So to me, like a black belt is like a PhD or being, a, you know, a, like having a, like a, 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 I just hired someone recently who was a, was a, a star in the UCLA gymnastics team. And I was like, I, you know, I don't, you, whatever you have in you that enable you to do that, if I could just turn it to like this other thing, you're gonna be amazing. So like you can't have too much education in my book. And I would say it depends greatly on, as David said, if there's something you're very passionate about and you want to learn more about it and it's not going to saddle you with additional enormous, because it's getting to be, un, for, for, many of, for many students it's getting to be unattainable to, uh, to go to graduate school, that if you're interested in the field, it's not necessary. And very often, if you're good enough, if you have the drive, uh, very, uh, very often companies will pay for you to get an MBA. Um, and we have wonderful programs, uh, professional programs that students 
um, can attend while working for the organization that's providing that opportunity for them. So uh, I only recommend, if you're interested in, in the field, I only recommend that you do it if, as David said, you have a passion for it and you know something you want to look into deeply, but it's absolutely not necessary to get into the field and to be successful in the field. And as I said, I often recommend that my students take the opportunities provided, especially by some of the bigger corporations, to earn their degree while they work for them. So if you stand out, they will invest in you uh, to, into a specific area. And by then, you might have a better understanding of where in the communication world you best fit. Because a lot of times, students come out and think that a job is a certain way and it requires certain skills or it looks like a certain day to day. And once they're in it, they quickly realize that that's not the case at all. Um, so we, we are often, I know for, speaking for myself as a first gen college student, I had no clue what some of these positions would look like in, in the real world. It was only mediated examples or things that I read in books or saw in magazines. And when I interned, I realized, whoa, this is nothing like what I read about. It's, it's not as glamorous as it seems at all. And so getting a good feel for what skills you need, what's, where you um, do best, in other words, what are your strengths that you bring to the table and, and, and cultivate those. The next question that's at the top right now is a big one. And it's, in your opinion, what do you think the next big trend in media will be? Think uh, Quibi by Meg Whitman. Uh, Jeff Katzenberg might argue that Quibi is also by Jeff Katzenberg. Um, I don't think Quibi is the next big thing, but that's me. Um, I, so the thing that we're in the middle of now is the rise of the individual uh, and the individual as a, as a, as a marketing, it's a one person, uh, marketing machine, influence machine, content creation machine. And again, I, I've got a long perspective. So the fact that, uh, you know, Steven Soderbergh makes a movie with iPhones, and it's a fantastic movie. Uh, the, the fact that, like, again, it's like one person, I know, going back to this, can do things that used to take hundreds or thousands of people to do. And so I, I think that is a part of everything that's the next big thing. Um, and so what it is, it causes like big institutions to think about how they amass their power um, and then individuals thinking about what they can do. And so in the media space, the power of the individual as a, as a marketing icon, let's say, talk about celebrity, um, to, to actually make a project go, to like step in front of a project and say, I'm part of this now and all of a sudden, five different streaming companies want to buy it. Um, the power of Pop Sugar actually to attach itself, we're a part of some television programs where we know we can bring an audience of you know, 40 million people to watch something. Um, there, there's, there's like, that just didn't exist before. So it's that, it, so I, I know I'm being a little um, abstract because I'm not like identifying like, it's this grid thing over there, like go oh, everybody do that red thing. It really is about in my mind, what individuals are capable of doing in influencing people and making things happen and starting companies in, in making their own Instagram stories which have millions of views. Um, it's the, the way that technology has enabled individuals to make expressions on a flat basis with the biggest companies in the world is just a huge change. And so if you figure out like what you can do with that, um, you, you know, there's just endless opportunity. I would say that I would hope the next big thing is that someone would figure out how we could do better about what, inf again, I'm, this is what I study, so what information is shared with what audiences? So who gets to decide what gets broadcast? Who, who gets to decide what stories to tell? Um, who gets to decide what becomes popular? Um, who gets to decide what stories are important and whose voices are heard and whose are marginalized? And so when I, when I, again, said that the internet was a fad, uh, part of the uh, excitement was that it would democratize voices, that we would get to hear from everyone. That's not what it's turned out to be. 
And I keep waiting for the trend where people rise up and go, this isn't what we signed up for. And I'd like to see a, a movement towards that. Um, whether that'll happen, I, I don't know. But that's, I would hope that this generation who seems to be very empathetic and very open to um, more viewpoints would, would value that. And so I'd be interested in knowing beyond the mainstream and who decides what's mainstream. We only have time for maybe two or three more questions top, so I'll try to make them good ones. Uh, another question. <laughs> I'll try. Another one. We could go back to Bandersnatch if you go want. Go back to Bandersnatch. <laughs> that would be maybe later. <laughs> Uh, another one that a lot of people really want to know about is how would you say that net neutrality has influenced working in media? Um, so philosophically, I think net neutrality is hugely important. Uh, but I don't think there is or has been net neutrality for, I think that it's just a, a hollow term. Um, it could be, it's more recently been formally under attack but in essence, uh, if you are Facebook or if you're Google and you control those, that algorithm and, and that distribution, uh, there's, uh, there's no such thing as net neutrality, I guess is my answer. Uh, so uh, I, I do think there's a possibility of, and again, going back to my obsession with individuals, individuals can break out uh, and, and reach millions of people by being really clever, charismatic, and understanding how to use the medium. So uh, I think that that's something that's never happened before in, in our history. So it's amazing. One person can rise up, a, a tabby or somebody could rise up, and all of a sudden, um, you know, that person is known by the whole world in a matter of days. So that's never happened. But in terms of, like, who controls the pipes, uh, the pipes are all under control uh, by the very large, powerful, and smart companies. And so it's really about watching those companies rather than, in my mind, rather than you know, uh, obsessing about what the exact net neutrality rules are. I don't even think they're enforceable. Sorry to be so cynical, but I just think, I mean, I don't think it's all bad and I love my business and I actually love what I do. But I do think that, that the reality is that there is not a level playing field known as net neutrality. Yeah, I wouldn't disagree with that. And I, I think even though it tried to start out that way, I don't think it, it ever truly was because uh, even when any particular platform had an ability to rise up, you still had to have the know-how um, to make it viable for people to access. And so you could put something out, but how do you get people to access it and to view it and to, um, for, and to then further that on? I don't think that ever existed. So, so down. Ask us an EP question. <laughs> Uh, well, no, there is ask another... Any, any questions. Well, this is also a downer, so... Um, I don't know if I'd call it a downer, but um, some people in the audience want to know, some of us are not engaged with social media. Is there a cost to this willful act? Are we totally screwed? <laughs> uh, so I'm really biased. I think you're fine. Uh, I think you're 100% fine. Um... It depends on what, I mean, if you want to do something with your life that requires influence, um, then you're not fine. Um, and it's interesting when, when, so now just on a job level, and this would just be on a, like a regular media job level, you know, everybody checks your following. They check your, it's like your, it's like your, uh, it's like your rating. Um, and so it's unavoidable if you want to be in that world to feel the pressure, obviously, you guys probably all know about fraud, about buying followers, all that good stuff. Uh, it's just the pressure. And actually, when I dig deep into the influencer business, what's really uh, kind of um, fascinating and weird and depressing to me is there's, there's this whole world of real, real engagement, meaning somebody really loves what you're doing. And then you do something that to make money, an advertiser or brand says, will you do this for me? And then people, your audience is very smart and they go like, I'm not really interested in that. And particularly on Instagram stories, and we make thousands of Instagram stories and we make millions of dollars on Instagram stories. And it's a terrible product for an advertiser. Don't tell them. Uh, but the problem is like people really, you have to like touch that bubble and if you think you're gonna get an ad, you're not gonna touch that bubble. So uh, I, I think that um, 
if you have in that world, if you need that influence and you treat it with respect, meaning you're authentic to it, it can be very powerful. If you're not in a world where you need that and you're just like, you want to learn information, you want to study something, you want to take, like, don't skip it all. It's like, fine. It's like, it, it is, I don't think it's a force for social good or bad. It's just a thing. And there's like, I don't like shellfish. I just don't. Like, people think I'm missing this whole part of life. I'm fine. I'm okay not eating shellfish. I think the, the social media is like that to me. For me, the short answer is no as well. Yeah. I mean, the, uh, uh, students of mine who will intern, sometimes uh, it's a personal connection, and that connection will call me and say, "These young folks, they don't just answer the email. They're on the they're on the media things. They're on the media things for so many hours, and it's a waste of time. What do they get from the media things?" Um, and but these are folks who are in the operations of the day to day of the business. Whereas I think that in uh, the bigger picture, big corporations understand that you need to have a presence. And so at least understanding the language, um, having an, an understanding of how they work uh, is helpful, but only if that's, I like to say, if that's your jam. If it's not, and that's not an area that you're into, I don't think that it's necessary. And the last question that I'll ask, I'll roll two of the top questions into one, is what are some valuable skills that you believe students should have or polish if they intend on pursuing work within the media industry and just general advice on someone graduating from college when it comes to finding their path in this industry? Uh, this is something I think about a lot, not only because I have kids in that age range, but also I hire a ton of, or have hired a ton of people. Uh, and it really comes down to this really simple, in, in my business, because you're not going to, you know, God forbid, operate on somebody's heart or, you know, et cetera, or try to launch a rocket, you're going to do media. Um, one is, like, to tell a good story. You'd be surprised at how many people cannot tell a good story. I'd say 90% of the people, and this is a storytelling business, and uh, you're listening to them at a party or whatever, and you're going to be like, dude, that's a terrible story. <laughs> like, if you can't tell a good story, I don't know whether that's learned or, 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 or just genetic or both of it, but if you can't tell a good story, uh, you're in trouble in this business. Um, secondly is learn how to write. Um, I, 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 I'm just amazed. At, I'm very picky when it comes to writing. I consider myself a writer. I love words. Um, and to, when I find someone in my company can actually write, I just get so excited. Um, cause I, and I used to be, when the company got big, I stopped. I used to like rewrite everybody's press release, rewrite everybody's script, rewrite this, rewrite that. Uh, because I couldn't stand the writing. And when I'd read like great writing, you know, like in the, in the New York Times or a, a great book, I just go like, it's such a miracle. Where are these writers? So learn to write. Uh, learn to persuade people. Uh, like so, so much of getting something done is just persuading a group of people. So in college, it's just a great time to learn. This is the problem I have with the work at home and the online learning and all that. Is I don't think you get, I don't know how you learn to persuade people if you're working on your own. So if you can learn to persuade a group of people, you can do anything. I mean, that's probably the number one skill. And then, you know, I mean, this is all cliche, but just like, I, it doesn't matter what subject you're learning, like the energy that it takes to actually think about something hard, um, I certainly, like it's, a light switch went off for me way too late uh, for college, for sure, <laughs> of like when I really was thinking about something. And honestly, it wasn't until I was at UC Davis Law School and I wrote a law review article, I was writing on a law review article, and I had a smart editor, and they were constantly like challenging every single uh, point that I was making. And I'm going, wow, like this is just some dumb article. And, and I was spending months on this thing. Uh, and so, it, and, and that was the point of my life, and it was like pretty late. And other things happened even later, but that point I realized that, that you could actually like think about something really hard and break through and do a breakthrough and get like way better at it. So um, if you can think, and it doesn't matter what you study, whether it's literature, politics, science, uh, the STEM uh, disciplines, I think that if you get those things out, if you're going to an industry that doesn't have a very particular skill set, like a neurosurgeon or whatever, or you know, a nuclear uh, a scientist and so on, like, you, you, you're you going to something where really it is about, am I persuasive? Can I write? Can I present? Can I think about something deeply? And then the creativity part uh, in the media industry 
is a very rare skill. Uh, certain people, it seems easy. Um, it's hard to describe. I call it the shower. Like most of my good ideas come out of runner in the shower. And I think it's just because it's like somehow the ability to free your mind up enough from like what's going on at that moment. I do a lot of walking meetings now. Uh, just say like, just put your phone back, put your phone in your pocket, put your, let's just walk around the block. And I find like it's even the movement of your body takes you out of um, like this anxiety in your head, or at least that I have, that gets so many distractions. So if you can learn to focus actually, to think about something hard, and then create something new out of that, that's creativity. So if you can get that, and college is like an awesome place to learn. Unfortunately, I did not learn that in college, but you guys should, because I wasted a lot of years not doing that. And definitely is the time to do it. I would agree with all of that and add that, uh, especially in the media world, it's really important if you're going to be persuasive that you know and understand your audience. And so uh, that's one key piece that seems to be missing quite often. Who, who are the people that you're trying to influence or persuade? And then what are you exactly trying to get them to understand or do? So sometimes people are persuasive without having a real understanding of what the end goal is. And so for a lot of my students, I ask them to critically think. And that takes a lot of, as you said, just time to be still. Um, we've moved into a space where we all want to do a lot of things at the same time, and it doesn't work well. So we need, we need people to sit down and be able to uh, in order to be creative, you need to be critical thinkers um, and to question what you're taught and what you're told and what you've read and think about it from a bigger perspective and what does that mean and how does that apply to you and what you know. Um, and also, in addition to that, adding to be curious. Um, I think some of us are so focused on what the next step is going to be that we lose sight of what we're interested in and what we're curious about because we don't think it's going to lead to something bigger or something that'll support us. Um, but we never know. We never know what interest is going to be the one that opens the door for us. And I could speak to that personally. Um, furthermore, I would add that um, it's really important that you um, give yourself an opportunity to think about what success looks like to you. Um, because we've been sort of attuned to what, what that is and what that looks like, and it's really quite different for all of us. So in that field, uh, in the media field, we require all types. So not everybody has to be, uh, we need the folks to do the, the project management. We need folks to run the finances. We need folks who can keep the, the very creative ones in line. And so there's a, there's a space for people in, in every industry, and we require different strengths. And so knowing what those are, I wish I would have known that in college. I had no clue. Um, so like you, I wish I would have been able to have a better understanding of what I brought to the table a lot earlier than I did. Well, before we move on to our last few notes, can we please get a big round of applause for this amazing Thank session? And as we get the uh, raffle set up, if you could all take a brief moment uh, to at least look <laughs> at the brief survey <laughs> on slido.com. It's exactly where you were just submitting questions. Uh, it will be open until Monday, although if you feel like you're going to forget in 30 seconds once you leave, perhaps best to do it now. It's very short, but it really, really helps us. Yes. And jar yes so i'm told the prize for this is a private screening of bandersnatch with me <laughs> <laughs> who's gonna get lucky did you watch it uh you know i i started it and i realized i don't like interactive storytelling <laughs> like i tell me a good story like i don't want to work, work for it. yeah but anyways uh the winner of the so i read the name uh, Mayrav Ravivo is our winner. Mayrav Ravivo. There you go. So thank you all for coming out this evening, uh, given that it's week nine um, and the pandemic. Uh, it really means a lot. We appreciate what... Uh, what an engaged and attentive crowd this was. Tell your friends about this series. We do talks on a variety of different topics. 
Uh, the next one, I believe, will be on science fiction and how science fiction influences real-world policy. So, word of mouth. Further discussion of Bandersnatch. I Further bet. discussion <laughs> to be included. Uh, word of mouth is very powerful for us. You can scan those QR codes up there if you're interested to find links to all of our relevant websites and social media pages. So, thank you all again.